The word mass is used in different contexts, and this is a very frequently occurring thing in physics because we invent a name for something before we completely understand it. So uh, rest mass, the, the only reason you need the term rest mass is because of Einstein, who pointed out that there's other kinds of mass. So Einstein says that what you mean when you say the rest mass is really how much energy something has when it's sitting still. That's the content of E equals mc squared. It's not that the total energy, no matter what, is equal to the mass times the speed of light squared. It's the rest mass is mass times the speed of light squared. That's what the mass means. When you're sitting still, that's how much energy you have. And how do you know how much energy you have? Well, you push the thing, exert a force on it, see how fast it accelerates, and then divide that force by the acceleration, that will give you the mass. The heavier something is, the larger this is, the smaller the acceleration is for any given force. Okay, so how does the Higgs mechanism account for this uh, mass? Well, the Higgs discussion is a very different thing because this is the idea of what mass is. The Higgs helps us understand where mass comes from for elementary particles. And there's a very long, complicated story you need to go through to answer the question why you need to explain where mass comes from. Why can't you just say things have mass? <laughs> the point is that Weinberg's attempt to come up with a theory of the weak interactions Without the Higgs boson, without this boson filling space, Weinberg's theory would have predicted that the electron must be massless, must have exactly zero mass, because particles spinning one way were acting differently than particles spinning the other way. And so, all right, we'll, we'll do the 30 second version of, of why that makes sense. The point is that Einstein says, if you have zero mass, you're moving at the speed of light. And vice versa, if you're moving at the speed of light, you have zero mass. Uh, so, if you're moving at the speed of light, then you can have an answer to the question, what is the rotation that you have in the direction that you're moving? And that's a once and for all question. There's an answer to that that everybody agrees on. If you're slower than the speed of light, then you can have a rotation in the direction you're moving, but someone else moving faster than you thinks you're moving in the other direction. There is no unique answer to what is your rotation in the direction you're moving. So Weinberg's theory only worked if there was a unique answer to the question, what is your rotation in the direction you're moving? Because if you're rotating one way, you interacted with the weak interactions. If you're rotating the other way, you didn't. And so his theory predicted that there needed to be a way of saying, what was your rotation compared to your motion? That's only possible if you're moving at the speed of light. That's only possible if you have zero mass. So the Higgs boson comes along and figures out a way to slow down these particles. So without the Higgs, they do move at the speed of light. The electron, the quarks, the neutrinos, they would all be moving at the speed of light. And that symmetry is broken by this Higgs boson filling space. And so we see particles that are moving slower than light. The Higgs boson gives them mass, and that lets Weinberg's idea match the real world. What the definition of mass is, in the modern way of thinking of things, is simply how much energy does something have when it's sitting still. So the mass is not like some intrinsic property, it's not some stuff that moves around, it's a, it's a measurement of what the energy is. But I guess the question is, why does that energy make things harder to accelerate? Well, you need to, you know, there's different kinds of energy. The mass is one kind of energy. There's also kinetic energy, there's potential energy, and so forth. And so when you take a, an object and you accelerate it, what you're doing is converting one kind of energy into another kind of energy. So if you have a heavy object and you accelerate it, it will have more energy once it's done accelerating. So the mass is telling you how much work you need to do to get something to move to a certain speed. Hmm. What about uh, relativistic mass? Relativistic mass is a term that I think should be banned from everyone's vocabulary. So. Again, if you take the Einsteinian philosophy that mass is a version of energy, it's how much energy you have when you're not moving, you can also ask how much energy do you have when you are moving. And the thing that you should call that is the energy. <laughs> but the thing that people sometimes like to call it, especially in the bad old days, is the relativistic mass. They talk about the mass increasing as a particle or an object moves closer and closer to the speed of light. But if the definition of mass is how much energy you have when you're not moving, that doesn't change no matter how fast you actually are moving. And I think it's actually a much more conceptually simple way to think about things. Gravitational mass is truly different, and that is a very useful concept. If you go back to Newton's way of doing physics and saying the mass is the force divided by the acceleration, this is what we would call the inertial mass. This is the answer to the question, how much force you need to give to accelerate something. Then there's something that is completely different 
than that, which is how much gravity does an object cause or how does an object respond to a gravitational field. So in principle, that's an arbitrary number. I mean, if you think about the electromagnetic force, right? A particle responds to an electric field depending on what we call its electric charge. Some particles have a positive charge, a negative charge, a big charge, a small charge, whatever. The electric charge is the electric equivalent of the gravitational mass. It's the thing that says how much do you respond to this force. It turns out, from Newton's point of view, it was just completely an accident, that the gravitational charge, the amount of gravitational field that an object causes, is equal to its inertial mass. So we say the gravitational mass, which is this kind of a bad term for it, but the gravitational charge on an object is given by its mass, by its inertial mass. And that is a feature that for Newton was just an accident. You know, it's just hard to understand why that's true. For Einstein, after he invents special relativity and says E equals mc squared, he spends 10 years inventing general relativity, his theory of gravity. And finally, once we understand general relativity, which says that gravity is the curvature of space-time, then we think we understand why gravitational mass and inertial mass are the same. Basically, they're, they're two different versions of the energy that something has. And it's energy, mass, momentum, all of these different things go into causing the gravitational field. So there's two questions. One is, how hard is it to push something? And another is, how much gravitational field does a thing make? In general relativity, it's obvious, once you understand general relativity, the answer to those questions are the same thing, that the gravitational mass and the inertial mass are equal. Someone moving fast with respect to me is moving slowly with respect to someone else. The way that it's warping space-time can't possibly change. Right. Now, the, the exception to that is if you have two objects that are both part of a bigger object. Right? So if I have an, an object that is creating a gravitational field and it itself consists of two other objects that are stationary, that would create a different gravitational field than if that one object consists of two other sub-objects that are moving with respect to each other. If, if, you, if you have a um, barbell and it's, it's not rotating, there is, in relativity, a difference between not rotating and rotating. Okay, there's no difference between moving and not moving, because that's depending on your reference frame, but there is a difference between rotating and not rotating. So if you take that barbell and you spin it, so now it's rotating, now it has more energy for everyone's point of view, and its gravitational field would be more. So the Earth, because it is spinning, according to Einstein, has a slightly larger gravitational field than it would if it were not spinning. This is an incredibly tiny effect, absolutely impossible to measure because the Earth is not spinning anywhere close to the speed of light, uh, but it's there and it's predicted by the theory. And in some things like neutron stars or black holes, it would be very, very noticeable.